Projector went black. Projector went black. Disasters tank more successful, right? So, who's experienced some kind of equipment failure or some kind of mechanical dysfunction? I want to hear some of the things that have happened. Yeah. Oh, I got uh, stories. I have, uh, <laughs> I'll be busy. Inline chiller. Yeah, yeah. inline chiller, of course. That's that. In the classroom, there's a sub, and somehow the return line came out of the tank. So sure. It was just pumping on the floor. But luckily, I came my home, so it doesn't suck up the eggs that small. Yeah. Out. So it only drain so much, but someone else wanted it. Sure. But yeah. it was pumping water out and stuff freaked out. All yeah, that's a mess. I think they're all going to die. What do you got, Jeremy? Um, How much time you got? <laughs> uh, so we had a breaker blow in my classroom the weekend after we got our eggs. Uh, so we still had eggs in the bottom of the tank and the air popped. And then we knew the breaker went off, so we turned everything back on. But apparently there was another breaker someplace else that tripped when we turned all the other ones on and we didn't know it. Got it. Okay. Other quick failure? Yeah. We had in the spring when it got really humid and the condensation from the tank um, tripped the power strip on the GFI. And no fire. No power. Just <laughs> <dropped. laughs> Other failures? <laughs> I get lots of calls of the custodian unplugged the thing. Sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, our chiller is the coil one, and the regulator on it went haywire. Most of the time, it was doing the job of keeping the temperature down, but it might be that it's 104 degrees to keep the temperature on the chiller. So, and then at the very end of last year, it just didn't work at all. Um, it was close enough to when we were going to release them that, that um, we were going to be okay, but we had to send them. Sure. So I've seen chillers blow fuses, right? Just keep everything's running, chiller won't kill. Um, so due to power loss, yeah. Have the fan in my chiller go. Sure. And so before I could get a replacement one, I had to turn on small fans and let it blow onto it so it cool back. Yeah. So all of those things, you can be notified instantaneously if they occur. Right now, in this room, even though your tank is wherever it might be. Uh, that's one of the things that I'll talk about is systems that do that. I've got one of those systems running on my home aquarium, and I can feed the fish from here. I can double the amount of fish food they get. I can know that there's water on the floor. I can know if I, if I have chiller, I can know if the chiller is working, I can know what the temperature was, I can know what the pH of the water was, um, I can know how many gallons per hour are going through the pipe right now. And 10 hours ago, I can look at a chart and see it doing this because the filter is plugging up. And I can see the filter to pop back up and it will keep going until it starts plugging up again. Those are all things that are possible. Uh, so that's one of the stuff I want to show people that. Wouldn't normally make it into an initial budget for them, uh, but for tanks that you want to make really, really cool proof and just want to improve, uh, those are our options. Whoa. It wasn't what I thought would happen when I pushed that button. Uh oh. Oh my goodness. You're pushing the arrow button. You should operate from the computer. So. Yeah. I can do that. I can do that. So the first thing on the slide is the Python, right? Very, very simple. Uh, you know, folks tote their buckets around, it's a big pain. Uh, a lot of folks either aren't aware of how they work or what they do. Uh, gotta make sure you use it properly to not have the disaster that can come when there's an amount of water. Uh, but moving water from the system and putting water back into the system, making that water change easier, you know, it's something I think that all initial teachers should be aware of. Uh, you should be able to hit this one. Okay. Um, but then there's also options to fully automate water tanks. There's a lot of tanks out there that have 
ground water changes that occur, we're not even touching it. And it all just happens on a schedule. And it all gets logged and we know that it happens, we have evidence that it happened. Uh, that's all possible. So we'll get more about that later. This is pretty cool. This is a brand new air pump. It's a power air pump. So most of you have a regular air pump. You got a battery backup air pump. The battery backup air pumps are cool because they just run off key batteries. You take them on release day. You can bubble into the bucket. Uh, this one does both things. So it plugs in. It charges like your cell phone. It runs all day long off the power from the wall. But then it continues to run after the power turns off. It's only a day. The battery backups with the D's. You can run them infinitely, six days on a couple of Duracells. Uh, but still, that's kind of a cool thing. You can also plug into your car, you know, pull the USB port. So, those are pretty cool. They make a single one and a dual one. Uh, those just came out. You can also connect them to those uh, power supplies, like for your phone, right? They extend the light. So, uh, do we dare use the controller? Left <coughs> arrow. Left arrow on the Okay, was that the first? Was that the right one? Yeah. Okay, so everybody has these sponge filters, right? You like to see two of them in the average 75 gallon tank that we help out with in the classroom. And this place is the store all the time. So we'll have 75 gallons of water, we'll have five, 600 cardinal tetras in that tank, or we'll have uh, 20 African cichlids that are this big. <laughs> High bio loads, and that's the only filters that will be on that tank. No ammonia, no nitrite, and reasonable nitrate levels based on our water treatment. Uh, but a lot of times they come by and they look like this, where the air cells or the hose is connected to the top, but there's no lift to it. And that filter doesn't run anywhere near as efficiently as the one with the lift to Even better <laughs> is if you put a chunk of airline tubing inside the filter and drop it down here, then it lifts from further down, you get even more suction. What's best though is when you put an air cell inside the sponge filter. Not only does it take that blub, 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 blub. And make it silent, but also there's actually even more water flow through the sponge filter. And these gray ones that works with, so you can pop the top off, there's a little nub on the inside, you can put the air going on. Some of the black ones, like the black plastic, this is dark black, some of the other brands, they're already they're already set up like this. They already have a shaft that goes down the middle, and the air gets released down here. But you don't have the ability to add the air stone without getting really like some MacGyver inside there, cut this away. One quick note is you can you can stack those too. So if you want more filtration, you got two, you want four, you can stack one on top of another. You can put the pieces and for each one. So if you buy another one, you just pull a few parts off and use it. And what shape or size here? It's got a bit. So there's like little cylinder ones. The one I'm drawing here appears to be one of the little uh I don't know what those are made of little white ones with fine bubbles. We usually use uh, the regular sandstone ones that are like a cylinder, like they're blue, and yeah, they're dark blue. They're, they're, the ones that cost four dollars are a lot better than the ones that are 99 cents. Or uh, if you cents. drop it down further with the piece of hose, the, the lower that air stone goes, the more volume of circulation you get because it's the lift distance that's going to gain the gallons per hour. And then the other thing, we'll, we'll see these things start caving in on the sides, where they look like a like a mirror, uh, and the, uh, that's because they're getting plugged up. So whenever you do a water change or every other water change, not a bad idea to pop that thing apart, throw it in the bucket of tank water, bring it out, throw it back into the tank. You know that way you're not exposing the bacteria that are too much stress, but you're getting rid of all the junk that's plugged up. Well, what we'll typically do is we pull the sponge fillers out, squeeze them into a bucket. Put them back in the tank, let them swell up again, bring them back down below, squeeze them again, and do it that way. Kids tend to make that an easier chore than carting them around the stool. All right, so high alkalinity water. A lot of folks have well water. A lot of folks test their alkalinity, and on your book, on your units, it's uh, parts per million, I believe, but it's like 120 to 180, you know, is the range. Uh, we use a different unit usually at the shop, uh, but you know how do you uh, how do you get that lower? Well, you know my, my water at my house is like 18, uh, 18 uh, dKH. So that's three hundred and sixty. Uh, the water at my neighbor's house is about one hundred and forty, like perfect. The water at the store oscillates between like twenty to forty. 
and very quickly turns to zero. Um, so they're all very three different waters and they're all geographically very close to each other. And traditionally, when you've got that high alkalinity water, there's not a lot of great ways uh, to get rid of it. There's not like um, <coughs> magic drops you can put in, you know, that, that fix that. Um, so we, we're talking about the, the K, the alkalinity here. So our units aren't that scary. Uh, they don't cost that much. You know, that one's 160 bucks. Uh, that's a screenshot from an online store, but that price happens to be <coughs> so, um, But you can fill a tank on that for you. We use these are made group trash cans. You can get those at Home Depot. You can get wheels for them. Our maintenance guys use those all the time. They beat them up. They work really, really well. Uh, you can also get fancier polyethylene tanks like from the tractor supply store. Uh, I get some special ones for our jobs that are uh, rectangles. They're very space efficient. Uh, but instead of a you know thirty five dollar trash can, you know it's a two hundred fifty dollar you know polyethylene rectangle. Uh, but they look really good and they uh, they fit all nice things. So the RODI unit or the reverse osmosis unit in this case will remove ninety seven percent of what's in the water. So we'll get rid of ninety seven percent of that alkalinity. We'll get rid of ninety seven percent of the phosphates, ninety seven percent of the copper, whatever it is that might be in the water that you're concerned about. It's going to get rid of it, and then you have to put it back. So either put it back by adding buffer, or you put it back by mixing some of your untreated water with it. Um, they waste water. So to make you know nine gallons per day is what this one's rated at, probably make 60 gallons per day, it's gonna waste 120 minimum. Might waste more down the drain. Now Jeremy might funnel that through some plants, you know, and take use of that water and do some free water changes. Um, but that is one issue with this. But this is the traditional solution to solve that problem. Uh, there's non-traditional solutions that I've been getting thinking at home that we're trying to tell all of you about, which is adding acid to the water. And so I've used this CPAM product called Acid Buffer and that same trash can. I fill it up with my water that's got the, the high alkalinity of 360. I add a certain amount of the acid. The water actually fizzes. It's like Sprite. <laughs> and it's because the acid is turning the products into CO2, the CO2 leaves the system, and I set my alkalinity right where I want it. And so I've got Romeo's tetras, angel fish, all these Amazonian fish that would not like my water as it is, all these plants that wouldn't like my water as it is. And simply by adding acid buffer and then using the two test kits that you already own, the pH test kit and the pH test kit. Um, you got to be a little careful. You gotta do it away from the fish. You gotta test the water before you use it. But this is an interesting example uh, of an alternative way to solve the same problem. Now you're not getting rid of the phosphates in the water, you're not getting rid of the copper. So if there's some of those kind of what you went in the water, this does not deal with it. Um, Rick's sink at his house, right, uh, has a level of copper in it that's high enough to kill any invertebrates. So people that try to keep like saltwater tanks over there. That's a problem. I suspect certain larval fish species probably don't like that copper value in the water too much either. Uh, totally, you know, marked for human consumption safe. Uh, but as far as for certain aquarium purposes, it's a bad deal. So the RO unit would be a better choice in his case. So that's yeah. kind of a cool thing. A little extra copper tone in my hair. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So this is something that's interesting. There's other types of acids to use. Acid buffer is like it's dry, you're not going to splash it up in your face. Uh, taking the guessing out of water testing, these are hand checkers. These are kind of cool. You know, it's like, is it, is it green? Is it yellow? Is it blue? I mean, is it, which one of these colors is they don't match any of the colors? So these are these are colorometers. And so you do the test and you put it in a little vial and you put it in this little leaf spray looking thing. And then you push the button and it tells you the number. So that's kind of cool. You know, do you want to spend 50 bucks on each test kit? You know, instead of 35 for a master test kit right away? Probably not. <coughs> But that might be kind of a cool thing to do. And they're available the next one. Um, in at least alkalinity ammonia and nitrite. There are quite a few more. I'm a little more familiar with the saltwater ones than I am with freshwater ones, to be honest. Uh, but these guys have been around for forever. They've been doing this kind of stuff for forever. Uh, so that's a pretty cool thing to, uh, to check out. <clears throat> and then a little segue. You mentioned yesterday the reef bowl. <coughs> that shows up pretty good. So. So the, the first two images are the same tank, same bowl. Uh, regular air pump goes into the into the tank. 
Uh, they have a kind of piece of tubing that put around the lip of the bowl. Uh, that could be any kind of clear, cool, you know, looking container that you find. Uh, we have some round ones we found, some spherical ones that are pretty cool. And we found the, the ideal lid, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a little bit of a searching game to find those things. Uh, but we found those and they work pretty good. Uh, there's a small heater. Uh, there's a, a, a temperature controller, an external temperature controller, kind of like your chiller, that will turn the heater on and off. And the maintenance is real simple. So once a week, we put some special food in. We let it kind of marinate for a couple few hours. And then we drain 100% of the water with the hose. takes about 10 seconds. And then we pour brand new saltwater back in. And then we enjoy it for another week. What's kind of interesting is when somebody in the past has wanted to do a reef tank in the classroom, it's, it's, it can be very successful, but there's a lot of information. This, this entire hour would have been a presentation on how to make that happen. How to test the water, how to buffer the water, because, how to because, control the use yeah. of the So all the issues that you would generally have to talk to somebody about how to do it in the chemistry conversations and stuff are essentially eliminated because all you're doing is feeding once a week and then draining and filling. And that all of a sudden, all those issues that we would have talked about have been drained, dropped down the drain, and we replenished everything that was either polluted or used up. And that's pretty much the, the short of it. Yeah. And some of these things are pretty cool. I mean, this is a reef building uh, coral that's an aquifera. Uh, this is called a nephia, a drain nephia, frog spawn, another stony coral that grows with skeleton. I mean, these are things that are necessarily regarded as like easy to keep in saltwater tanks, but they're easy to keep in this scenario uh, because of the way that these are designed and the way they're set up. And then can you click the click the link? Oh if that works. You have a little <laughs> yeah, <I'm the> old <laughs> guy. So this is uh how, how big of a value does this work up to well the one Wow, as well, much as they want to spend money on water. You can do a 200 gallon <laughs> water chain, a uh, really big one. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if you could. Yeah. If it so, so generally, we're there. thinking five <laughs> gallons and under, and probably one to two gallons. I think more yeah. realistic. Once we get past that, I recommend that we have that conversation and talk about parameters <laughs> and how to keep those parameters. It's ranges that you're trying to keep a tank system in, it's not specific numbers. So even if you wanted to do a reef tank, it isn't a very difficult chore, but information is needed. It's not for them. It's like what kind of calcium level would you need? What kind of alkalinity level would you need? What do you use to increase the calcium? What, what chemical do you use to increase the alkalinity? How do you get extra organic residues out of a system so that you don't have extra algae and nutrients? that you would otherwise have. So, yeah, so you can see the bubbler, you can see the corals just hanging around. So all the water flow is produced from the lips of the air. It's a base, it's just a clear base. This particular one has like a little, uh, like, a, I don't know, a top of a sundae from the You know, as the lid inverted, so those are pretty cool. So what is the cost of a lot of that coral? Sure. So corals can start at like 10 or 15 bucks. Uh, there are stores that will sell like a $5 frag, they call it fragment. Uh, we haven't gotten too much into the $5 thing, but yeah, we usually do it for 10 or 15 bucks. So most so, of the corals then are like $10. There's plenty that are more, <laughs> but, there, but there are plenty to choose from that are 10 to 15 bucks. And how many different corals are in something like that? Well, it's whatever you like, right? You know, um, I have one species in mind, and my, my are enemies. Uh, but they're not coral, but the uh, but this one's got quite a few. Uh, it's got some Kelepella, it's got some zoanthid. This is called the uh, it's called a Zoophora. What's a Zoophora? There's a common name for uh, for a Zoophora. That probably looks cool on a computer screen. Whatever that is. So <laughs> <laughs> some kind of interesting uh, stony coral. So is this going to outgrow it? Yeah, they will. So they're going to get too big. So that one of those first pictures on the screen was that green tree looking thing, that neon green tree. That bowl is actually a customer brought from Natalie to introduce us to this concept. And she, about every, I don't know, six months, brings me one of those that's way too big. You know, we get a bigger, smaller one. Let me do it again. <laughs> anyway.
And so the uh oh you can prove that she gets credit for that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. 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 it's like yeah, it's a nice specimen. So hey, sure. it's not exactly. loud, you can see we work, it. we help each other out. Yeah. Um if you're draining all the water, no fish. No exactly. So no large creatures. You know, no so fish, no big shrimp. How do you if you're draining all of the water, I would assume that the other the, the fresh water the clean water is ready to go in. Mm -hmm. Temperature? So I put uh, mine's above my kitchen sink, and so I just kind of put the warm water in the kitchen sink, and I throw my jug in there and let it warm up. And I take the meat thermometer and kind of put it in both both sure things and make sure they're within a degree. And then there it goes. Now, yeah, other, other people have had a heater in a bucket, so let's have a bucket of salt water, throw a heater in there, set the temperature, you know, and just have a little bubbler in there to move the water around, and uh, that works out. Uh, yeah. They do a heater, they have a tiny heater uh, and a little external temperature control. Uh, that, uh, so they, they have that, like the whole bowls. The, the setup for the bowls, if you had nothing and we got you everything, it's like two something, like 250. Um, part of that's the light. The light's probably the most expensive line item. Uh, but if you picked up a you know bowl at the thrift store, that's where mine came from, like three bucks. You know, mine's like a like tall, like it's a cylinder, right? It uses the same lid. But it's more like this shape, uh, but with a taller, um, taller than whatever you call Try shrimp. Um, I haven't. Uh, I'm probably gonna try some hermit crabs. Uh, and throw some hermit crabs in there. Uh, the my guess is that the the, the ability to match the water is, is going to be the challenge, and then that's not going to handle that change. You know that, that even though we, within a week, I think the water <coughs> has some kind of shift to it, and then it's going to be too hard to match the pH to match the and we want to take that guesswork out of it. So, but they thrive. I mean, with just coral gardens, they just they thrive. Other questions about those? Another cool classroom uh, printer is jellyfish tanks. Jellies. Uh, these are two gallon tanks and five gallon tanks. Jellyfish are been around for a while, and they were kind of the first one that we saw that that did it on volume and did it well. Um, so for a little under four hundred bucks. They sell the two gallon tank. Uh, it comes with three jellies. Uh, you actually set the tank up, and you get a little card, you get money, and then you fill out the code. And then a couple days later, uh, three jellies show up to your door, you know, with their food, and you put them into the tank. We have uh, one old non right now uh, that's it was two years old on Thanksgiving. That jelly, moon jellies live for about one to two years. Uh, at the Medusa stage, which is where they are right there. Uh, so we're feeling pretty good about that. It's two bodies didn't last as long as it did, but it's like, you know, a centurion in, in really age. Uh, they also have a, a five gallon, which is even cooler, it's a little bit bigger. And the five gallon comes with an Artemia hatchery uh, that's quite unique. That's a bright shrimp, uh, sea monkeys. Uh, that's one of the best foods for the jellies. And it's a passive uh, like dish. That's really, really easy to use. There's no aeration. It's just a really, really simple, simple <laughs> object that grows a natural food supply for the jellies. Uh, they've also told me, I've looked at myself, that they've developed a ton of curriculum regarding jelly tanks for each state. And you can actually get copies of stuff that applies to your standards for your state that relates to the jelly tank. So those are pretty cool. And then there's a remote control for the line that sends the jelly image up on the ceiling. So, and moon jellies are, are minimally, uh, I can't the word, uh, uh, the sting is very minimal. Uh, you'll actually see uh, touch tanks with moon jellies, you know, at some zoos, uh, and at some like uh, the fish tank traditional tanks, where you actually can you know, use your fingers and actually touch uh, the jellies. Uh, with early on, in, in when we kept jellies, and we didn't really know what we were doing, we were still figuring it out. Uh, a couple of them got some issues, they got some holes in the bells. And their big tentacles were like going like through the holes. Uh, back then, we I took one of them, used a plastic cable tie, kind of teased the tentacle out through the hole. We made the adjustments that we've now learned about, which are basically just good food. Uh, and within days, the hole filled in, and the jelly recovered. Right. So we've gotten really, really comfortable, really, really confident with jellies. Uh, they're really not that hard to keep. It's a very simple system. Uh, there's not a lot of different bells and knobs to move. Um, it's pretty much off of food frequently and keep the water clean and they're they're heavy guys. So, so those are pretty cool. Is it 
And they're Captain Crab jellies. jellies. So, so, yeah, yeah, we, have, we have a couple set up running, you can see. And then also, uh, we always keep them on hand for people who uh, pick up and take home. Back to Santa Things. <laughs> so, uh, some of those disasters, right? The semi meter is something that a few salmon teachers have gotten from us, and a few people have gotten around. We honestly haven't personally spent as much time with it, just with the daily everything. But the really notable feature here is it tests ammonia. It's a gauge for ammonia, digital, and it sends you that data and graphs that data uh, as it gets outside of certain ranges. It'll do the pH as well and the temperature, uh, but it's a monitor. It's not a controller. It's not going to take any action besides inform you. Uh, but the centimeters are relatively inexpensive. I think the home is like 150 bucks, uh, and it's and it does those things. And then you replace these slides every so often. And then that refreshes the uh, testing, right? Uh, the people that have used them uh, that I've talked to, uh, they keep coming back and buying slides. They love them, that kind of thing. I do think that the 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 setup isn't very intuitive, uh, and the support for the setup is is lacking. So it definitely is going to be somebody that's a little more tech savvy that's going to be more successful, you know, with those. Uh, the next one is the one we're far more expert in. These are the net boom systems from Apex. This is the system that I have on my tank at home. This is the one that will tell you if your water's leaking. Uh, it'll tell you how much power your chiller's using. It'll tell you uh, if your temperature's too warm. It might even tell you if the air temperature's too warm in the classroom, you know, or the water temperature. Or you want to click to the next one. All right. So then there's the there's the dose, which is the water change system or a dosing system. You can add any kind of fluid, any kind of liquids with it. The thing on the bottom left is flow meter, that's how many gallons per hour are going through pipes. Uh, the next one over is a leak detector, is there water on the floor? Uh, do something based on that. So it's going to test your pH all the time. It's going to log the data. Here's the pH graph. Uh, it built in the map, so it's got, you can't probably read the numbers, but the minimum was 7.72, the average was 7.82 looks like, and the maximum was like 8.05. And then there's, you can press the, whatever freak letter that is, uh, and it, uh, it tells you where the alerts should be, right? So it tells you what would be out of range for your particular thing, which is kind of cool. Or you can go to the and then I can go back. So here's a week. This was uh, one of our tanks in the store. I, I pulled this image yesterday uh, from the 5th to the 12th, and that's all the data. I can go minute by minute and I can see what the pH was throughout. I can overlay the temperature over that. I can overlay my notes over that, so I can take notes and make uh, the water change fed fish lost six fish, so on and so on. And it'll overlay those things over this, so you can kind of see the patterns. Uh, but I can also go back for three months, right? And so when you're talking about losing your fish, and wasting like giving your logs, you're like, here you go, here's my logs. So, so I won't give you the ammonia here, you know, but it does give you a lot of good stuff. Uh, automatic feeding, so you, you know, a lot of you use the EHEM automatic feeder uh, to dump uh, pellets in the tank. Uh, this one has some of the AFS, the automatic feeding system, uh, and the difference there is that it's all controlled through Apex Fusion, which is the central central brain. Uh, the automatic water changes, it's going to pull a very precise amount of water out of the aquarium and throw it away and put that one water back. Uh, accurate to <coughs> point, is it 0.1 milliliters or 0.01 milliliters? But it's super accurate. Uh, so we don't even turn off the, we have automatic top-offs on a lot of tanks, so they evaporate water, they fill themselves automatically. It's actually enough, we don't even turn this off. So like the salt water tank, you don't want to like take out salt water from that fresh water. Um, so, but it doesn't do that, it'll, it'll, it'll maintain it that uh, carefully. Uh, your chiller works, but your pump failed, or your hose flopped off, or whatever's going on, right? Um, all those things you would be notified about instantaneously. So there'll be an action taken because you told program to, and then also uh, it'll uh, tell you what's going on, or, or either one. Uh, they're not cheap, right? Uh, they start at about 500 bucks, and then you buy all the modules and cool things. There is one called the Junior, that if you can find some, we've got a few left. They're 250. Um, they're clearance for whatever people want to sell them for now. I think we were doing 150 on them. Uh, and then we do 10 percent off for teachers all the time. I don't, well, you know, be allowed to do that on the new ones. We find a way to give you something uh, to compensate for the discount we're not allowed to give. But the uh, but the junior uh, does all those things. Uh, it, it can do all those things. You'd add add the features to it. 
Uh, just the junior doesn't come with a PH probe. And then the new ones are all built in Wi Fi. They're like super easy to use. Uh, they're, uh, they're good. That is that. And then for you, what questions do you have about any and all that crazy stuff? <laughs> I know it's not the only thing, what's your opinion on undergrass? I think that's the filter. Well, the biggest, the, the capacity is fantastic, right? The, the filtration capacity, they were a game changing thing, 80s, right? Um, the trick, but then, and, and, and the water would be crystal clear, uh, the biological filtration would be tremendous. Uh, there's nothing like hanging outside your tank. The condition we talked about with the hose, right? Uh, the problem is that everything's pulled down. All the crud's pulled down, and then it goes under the plate, and then it's hanging out, and then it's there, and it's there, and it's there. Um, and it, it's, it's like having the gravel in the tank that Jeremy thinks I like, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that I usually don't. Uh, but, the, uh, but it's like that, you know, but worse, because you've got a, an area where the waste can build up that's relatively inaccessible. Now people do like a reverse flow on them and they do a couple different tricks to try to prevent that. But like right now when you're siphoning the bottom of your tank and there's nothing on the bottom, it's easy to remove 100% of anything that you can see. If you have gravel, you know, the, the janitor that's feeding the fish, right, every morning, right, it's hard to see. Uh, if you have the other gravel, it's even harder to see because then, then if you do gravel siphon it, the, the gravel siphon won't get 100% of what's under the plate. And so, We've sold a bajillion underground filters, but it's been about yeah. 15 years since I think we got anybody one because of that issue, because it just builds and builds and builds and builds, and then eventually it needs to be uh, overhauled. Uh, it needs to be drained. Now, a salmon tank, it's going to be temporary, right? It's not year long. So it's an interesting thing, but I think, I think an advanced keeper could have a really good situation. I think uh, to send that out as the beginner way to have it would create a lot of problems, you know, because the, the potential for nutrients to just be constantly breaking down and versus being released. The one thing I want to that I always talk to customers about because you can have a tank that all parameters are good, but very um, concerning, as in excess nutrients. Uh, but all tests show up good. And the point I want to make is that in one one millionth of a gram of excrement, there's over a million bacteria. Okay, the types of bacteria that are sometimes bracketed as good are typically growing on the surfaces of things and dealing with the chemicals that are caused when all of the organics or excrement breaks down. Right, and so you can't have too many of those. Like. You can have all those you want because those are taking care of the chemicals that are created from the organic breakdown process. Mm -hmm. Those are the bacteria in your sponge filter, when you're filter, 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 filter. <laughs> but to but to separate out and grab. Somebody was mentioning how they siphon the schools as they kind of pool up for the debris. What a great idea! But anytime you can strategically separate the breakdown process of organic residues and actually remove those as often as you can without disrupting the biological filtration, the better off you are. So something like an undergravel filter, it's a hodgepodge. It's got all the excrement, breaking down the organics, lots of organotropics doing their job, right? But it also has the surface areas to break down the ammonia nitrite that hematrophic bacteria is colonized on. So it's just a sloppier way of doing it. We did it. That the underground filters were the savior, right? Because back in the 60s, nobody knew those kind of things. And by the 70s, now all of a sudden we learned to use underground filters, and all of a sudden the ammonia problems and the nitrite problems that nobody understood were taken care of. So it was fantastic. But as the years have gone by, whether it's a back filter, they've strategically separated the fault responsibility of mechanical filtration from the fault responsibility of bio. Of, of, Hematrophic bacteria breakdown process. So one will have a bio wheel, then it'll have a trapping filter. It's one will have a sponge, then it'll have some biomedia on top of that. So the back filters and the hand filters just kept getting better and better and better. The media 
media kept getting more and more porous and more surface area for the bacteria. So the, the, the auxiliary filters that ran tanks just kept improving, and then eventually they outstripped the benefits of an underground one, right? Uh, so that's from our perspective, right? But, uh, but there's been plenty of, there's a lot of folks that use underground ones to this day. Uh, that, uh, you know, so and they work. I mean, they work then, and they work wouldn't, wouldn't be standing here if they didn't work because they, they paved the road to success. And I mean, the water gets crystal clear, right? Because everything's constantly getting pulled down. Uh, and without any, you know, without without pads, without sponges, without all that stuff, it just, it just goes down. Okay. Um, what about, I mean, a lot of See, that's really, that, when Jeremy spoke yesterday, that definitely lit a fire for me, uh, because I think that's pretty cool. So the, uh, I don't know, did they, did they pick it submerged plants? I don't well, know. Probably it's too cold for most of the plants. It is too cold, yeah, for most yeah. of the aquatic plants. But that yeah, was, and then we also don't want to create a, you know, we don't want to be putting, you know, like non-native. You can throw some LED in there. But the, but no, for like the hydroponic thing, um, or aquaponic thing, I, when I was, when I was listening, I was kind of like, why isn't spark balls in here? You know, why isn't there a crank on that wall? And why isn't there a little setup that goes by the window? And Steve's the water just over there, goes through the chiller on the way, you know, and then it comes back in the tank, you know, and there's whatever lettuce or whatever it is that's, that's growing. It seems like a no-brainer. Um, it seems like there's plenty of nitrogen. It seems like it's added less in value. Um, it seems like it can be a very simple bonus filter on these kinds of tanks. Um, I, mean, so, I, was, I was kind of going at, like, um, are there any, you know, submersible aquatic plants that would be okay yeah. in the sand tank? I, I, I think we'd struggle with the cold. Uh, canadensis, I think, would be okay. Yeah, canadensis, it's like that type of a mattress. And yeah, I mean, you can find it in every creek in the entire state, so. Yeah, now in Americana, too, you can find that in the rivers. Yeah. Has anybody yeah. used underwater plants, cold water underwater plants in the same thing? Or like, yeah, any more? Any more? Um, sure. yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, I think, I think uh, if nothing else, I think that's a great way to communicate among all of you and try something like that, whether it's candidensis or like you say, penny wards or whatnot, and share those ideas, maybe even some photographs of what you're doing and how it's looking and others trying it out. But we also have as they get, you know, a bit older, well, I, I don't know if they would, you have to be careful because they're going to want to tear it. You know, just realize that you've got some characters in there that it has to engage with and engage in a way that it's not just floating to the top so, and not trapping debris and finding mm -hmm. the deceased fish that you miss. <laughs> I mean, plants are wonderful plants. You know, pick up those nutrients, they add oxygen to the water. I mean, they're, they're a benefit to, to aquatic systems. Uh, the, that, that's the challenge of the payback. I, I think the aquaponic thing is, is the thing because it's, you know, you don't block the fish, uh, the whole like insulating the top of the tank with the ugly foam. You know, it's a bummer that it's ugly, right? But at the same time, you know, a lot of folks can't get their tank cool enough or their chiller works overtime, you know, costing more power, more electricity. Chiller is running, it's producing heat that adds heat to the room. You know, it's, anytime you can get that chiller to work less, uh, the better. So. Uh, with like the aquaponics sand, you don't have to worry about the insurance and other bacteria because you're not going to go over the media and whatever you want. All that, all that media with that surface area, you know, that much better filtration. I mean, it's, 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 so it's yeah, brilliant. I, I mean, it's really, because I thought about doing one, but I didn't think it would be appropriate. Way. Yeah, yeah, because all that, all that clay uh, hydrocon or is that, is that what it is? Yeah, you know, is uh, it's all got tons of surface area and it's, it's, it's yeah, it's like it. Everything was like, yep, yep, great idea, awesome. You know, so it's, we're gonna market it now. Yeah. <laughs> Starting next year, there will uh, you can purchase it at Bruce Pets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Okay, I think that was great. Thank you guys so much. Robert.